Welcome to More Than Words, a podcast about treating the whole child brought to you by the Reading and Language Learning Center. My name is Tristan and I am your host. Today we will be talking to Dr. Lynn Adams about parenting on the spectrum. Good morning, Dr. Adams. How are you? I'm fine, Tristan. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Um, We're really excited to have you back on the podcast again. And I know since we had you in an earlier episode, some people might know a little bit about you, but would you mind giving us a recap about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Um, I am a former university professor, so I'm a PhD level speech language pathologist, and um, my specialty is birth to five, child language disorders, autism spectrum disorders, and um, syndromes. I, I'm one of those who is always interested in syndromes too. So, um, so that's my area of expertise. I, uh, as I said, recently retired from being a professor, and now I work part-time in a private practice actually treating children with speech and language disorders. So I joke that it's my first real job. (laughs) Out in the world. Right? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And where are you located in the world? I live in a little bitty town in the middle of North Carolina called Troy. And um, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's very beautiful. (laughs) Right. Um, We don't have any broadband signal, but it's very beautiful. (laughs) And (laughs) um, so I'm right in the middle of the state of North Carolina. Awesome. Um, And if listeners were going to find you on Facebook, LinkedIn, I don't know, any social media or the web, where would they find you? Um, I just have my personal page on Facebook now. I used to have a professional page. Um, but I shut it down. I just couldn't give it the attention that I wanted to. Right. But I'm, I'm Lynn Adams on Facebook. They can find me there. I also work for more pediatric therapy services. Okay. And we have a Facebook page. And so you can find lots of resources there as well. Awesome. And for all the listeners, I will put that in the show notes so you guys can see it. But amazing. All righty. Let us talk about parenting on the spectrum. So my first question is, can you just give a brief interview of, or interview, excuse me, overview <laughs> of challenges that parents face? Absolutely. Um, no one knows prior to delivery that they're going to give birth to a child with autism. So it's not like you can prepare. There's no genetic test that could say, oh, your child may have this. And autism, the, the umbrella term autism spectrum disorders is a, the truest definition of an umbrella term because the, the myriad, the, the actual spectrum of uh, challenges that come under that umbrella are vast and varied. Right. You can have a child who's m- perhaps minimally impacted by autism, and you can have a child who's significantly impacted by autism. And um, you can have a child who's minimally and severely impacted in the same child because some things will come easily for them and some things will be very challenging for them. So, But the overall challenges and the thing that I think is the most important that um, parents understand is that their child's sensory processing system is likely to be disrupted. Okay. Um, and maybe disrupted is the wrong term. It's likely to be different. Um, you know, we're talking so much about neurodiversity that I don't want to put a negative on it, but there are some negative outcomes from sensory challenges too. Right. So, um, but certainly their child's ability to process incoming sensory information may be different than the parents processing. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're expecting the child to hear something and respond this way and the child responds differently or the child sees something and the parents expect an ex- uh, a response and they don't get that response. Right. So um, and it's important to remember that when we talk about sensory processing, we're not just talking about what we see and what we hear. We talk about what we see, what we hear, what we can taste, mm-hmm. what we can smell and what we can um, feel tactile, right. and also our sort of body in the world sense okay. of reception. Right. So we know where we are in the world. I know that I'm sitting in a chair, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so it's not just what I see and what I what I um, hear. Right. Uh, the other senses play into that. And um, particularly with olfactory, with the sense of smell and the sense of taste, um, children who have autism often have feeding challenges. They'll, they may become very picky or restricted eaters. And that could be a part of 
the way something tastes. It could be the way it feels in their mouth. Right. So the sensory challenges are huge. And I don't want to ever kind of underplay that. I think parents need to know going in that that's going to be, that may be the the beginning of a behavior challenge later on. Okay. That may be why the child is not successful at something. So we have to look at always consider the sensory information and parents have to be flexible. Right. Extremely flexible. And that doesn't mean bending over and touching your toes, folks. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have to let go of some preconceived notions. Right. Uh, I think any parent will will tell you that they had to give up preconceived notions when their child was born because they were sure that their child was going to be born and sleep eight hours through the night and take <laughs> a bottle or the breast and have no feeding challenges and not need some specialized formula that costs $50 a can, that sort Oof, of thing. Right. And the reality is, is that parents have to give up those illusions very quickly because yeah. they got a baby and the baby's like, no, I'm going to do my baby thing and you're coming along for the ride. And so once once you realize that, <laughs> then um, parenting is a, is a bit easier. But the sensory needs are so subtle and they're so pervasive. You know, there's nothing you do on the planet that doesn't involve your senses. Right. I mean, think of, there's nothing, you know. Um, you can't do anything that doesn't involve your knowing where your body is. Exactly. Um, or hearing something or seeing something or tasting something. Right. So um, what we also need to understand that is if there are unmet sensory needs, if your mm -hmm. child needs more proprioceptive input or kinesthetic input, um, if your child needs less auditory input and you don't meet that sensory need, then you may that may develop into a problem or a, a behavior challenge later on. Unmet sensory needs can lead to problem behaviors. That's that's a, a tried and true longstanding fact yeah. With regard to, to children on the spectrum, if you don't meet their sensory needs, it's going to come out some way later on and it may not be pretty. Right. You know, it can be very challenging. Yeah. Um, so as I, as I alluded to, feeding problems are another big thing that parents on the spectrum need to be prepared for. Doesn't mean they're going to happen, but they need to be prepared for it. Now, I don't have any data that says early on bottle feeding or breastfeeding that that's necessarily the challenge, although there's I'll, I'll talk about some examples where it could be, but certainly later on when the child's transitioning to um, more solid foods, you may have a child who will not eat anything that isn't pureed because the oh. minute there's a lump in it, it's like, nope, uh, there's a lump. It feels wow. weird in my mouth. Right. So you've been feeding me pureed peas yeah. and I love pureed peas. I don't, but <laughs> somebody does. Um, but if you then start putting some lumps of peas in there, Mm -mm, it feels weird. Right. It doesn't necessarily taste different, but it feels weird. And I can't deal with that. So but out it comes. Yeah. So, um, the, but there can be some, some early challenges, even in breastfeeding. And um, it's not something that I think gets talked about a lot, but think about um, the moment of breastfeeding. That's an incredibly physically intimate act. Right. So the baby is right up there in mama's breast. And mama has mama scent. Mama has her own natural <laughs> scent. Mama mm -hmm. also probably took a shower. Well, hopefully, hopefully somebody <laughs> helped hopefully. so mama could take a shower. Right. <laughs> I'm sure the mamas are like, I haven't taken a shower in months. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I get it. But mama took a shower. She washed her skin with that favorite body wash. Right. And she shampooed her hair with that lovely scent. And she put on some deodorant because she had a moment to do that. And it mm -hmm. scented beautifully too. But all those scents are now laid on top of mama's natural scent. Mm -hmm. And so what mama can't, mama doesn't think she smells like a bunch of products. <laughs> right. But a baby who's right there intimately latched on to the breast may be experiencing all those scents. Right. And it could be overwhelming. There are reports of babies who push away from the breast. Wow. And so um, that was considered a rejection of the mother. Um, I'll, I'll go back in history a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, back back in the day, it was about <laughs> 19 in the 50s. There was a man named Bruno, Bruno, excuse me, Bruno Bettelheim. And he was not a bad person, um, but he had some bad ideas. Um, Bruno Bettelheim spent time in a concentration camp. So let I think we have to agree that his view of the world perhaps was very challenged relative to others. Right. But he he put forth this hypothesis that autism came from 
um, what he called a refrigerator mother. Interesting. She, she was cold. She was aloof. And she was subconsciously rejecting the baby. And the baby knew that. So the baby rejected the mother back. Oh. So you get that baby who now is, you know, not making eye contact and may push physically push away from the breast kind of thing. Right. And so that gained a lot of traction. Right. I mean, that was a prevailing belief until the probably early 70s when people said, no, 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 no. Um, because that would mean you could create autism based on your behavior. Right. And and I, I say this and it sounds flip and it probably is a little flip, but if we could create autism, we would have numbers higher than we already do. And we already have ridiculously high numbers. Yeah. So um, if you could abuse or reject or neglect a child into autism, we would have one in two, right, one in right. three. <laughs> so, um, so that, that we know that's not accurate, but, but he saw this baby rejecting the closeness of the mother as the baby perceiving the mother's rejection of the baby. You oh, can see geez. how this sort of cyclical thing got going. Well, right. the, what probably happened was that the baby was sensorily overwhelmed, mm -hmm. pushed away, had nothing to do with mother's physical or emotional, social, emotional well-being. Right. And he misinterpreted that. Um, now, like I said, thankfully, we gave up that belief, but it, pers it um, was pervasive for about 20 years. And that's wow. too bad because... No mother then was like, oh, I think I'll take my child to the doctor so somebody can tell me that I created this, that this right. is my fault. Right. So women didn't take their kids to the doctors. No. The other thing that he that he misunderstood was that the children he was observing were from wealthier, um, more higher income families oh. because they could afford this kind of intervention. Right. Well, those women perhaps were perceived by him differently as more perhaps more aloof, maybe more formal. Um, higher educated, whatever. So he was perceiving them differently than perhaps they intended. So, right. um, so there's your little history lesson. Thank you um, for that. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, I'm just a bundle of information. <laughs> but, uh, but the feeding, the feeding problems um, are almost always result of some kind of sensory thing. Right. So um, it may, it may, those feeding challenges may appear early on in the first year during with breast and bottle feeding, um, but they may not until the end of that first year when you're trying to transition from pureed foods to uh, more chunky foods. Right. Um, so that's a biggie. And that's, I mean, if you ask a parent, the, the times they feel most insecure is when they can't get their kid to eat. Right. Because it feels like a fundamental failure. Right. I'm the parent. My baby won't eat. Yeah. I can't imagine the be breast being rejected and, oh, and the no. fundamental failure that one must feel then. Right. But can't get the baby to take the, you know, the chunky, you know, toddler food off the spoon, then, right. you know, what's wrong with me? I'm not a good parent. And the reality is it has nothing to do with parenting. It has to right. do with that baby's brain and how they're processing sensory information. Um, so I've talked a lot about sensory, probably to the exclusion of everything else, because that's really what is at the basis early on of the challenges that most children on the spectrum face. It's how they're going to be able to process and gain information from incoming sensory input. Right. It's not enough just to perceive it. You have to then be able to extract information from it, mm -hmm. store it in your brain so that when you encounter this later, you'll have an idea of what's going on. Right. And that may be the challenge. Um, outside of that, what parents need to be prepared for are questions from other people. Okay. Um, Well-meaning people. Right. Right. Um, you know, why, didn't, why isn't little Johnny talking? Why does he walk around doing this? Why is he, why isn't he doing that? Or why are you worried about him? He's just fine. He'll grow out of it. He'll right. talk when he's ready. Um, Einstein didn't talk till he was five. That's a common one. Well, oh, um, let's all, let's all agree that Einstein was not typical. Right. You know, let's, I mean, I, I understand. Yes. He didn't speak in complete sentences until he was five. Wow. He also had a very high IQ. And not everybody has a high IQ right. that they have that there to compensate for whatever else might be happening. So it, it, it's one of those things that parents will hear. Um, you're, oh, you you need to just spank him when the baby's having, the child's having a meltdown. Oh, you just need to spank him. He just he just needs to be have a good, good whooping, Jeez. as they say here in North Carolina. <laughs> and um, nobody needs a good whooping, right. and particularly not a child. Correct. But, um, so you're going to get a lot of unsolicited advice. You're going to get questions um, and you're going to feel overwhelmed. Right. And that's OK. That's a normal response. So that's when you go to um, your state's Autism Society of America site. 
Okay. Every I think every state has one. Yeah. Um, and certainly there's a National Autism Society of America. There's also the National Autism Association. Okay. Both have great resources, um, great things for parents to tap into, to get their questions answered, to find support. So uh, go there for advice, not from um, your Aunt Susie or your next door neighbor. Right. Um, <laughs> because they, they may be well-meaning, but they may be ill-informed. Right. Um, the next thing you need to be prepared for, the next big challenge is going to be education. Yeah, we have an educational system that values um, sitting quietly, crisscross applesauce, right, um, with our hands folded neatly in our laps for about twenty minutes. And I know most three-year-olds can't do that. Period. Oh, no. And if you have a child with any kind of um, sensory needs that that tells them they need to move, their body needs to move, they're craving that movement, then sitting for twenty minutes is probably going to be a challenge. Well, yeah. that means your child's going to have an educational challenge in um, daycare. Right. Or pre-K, because that's when circle time starts. Mm -hmm. So uh, parents re recognizing that education is going to be a challenge gets them ready for that. They, and that means you're preparing, preparing for education from the day they're born. Right. Not, oh, now she's three. Let's talk about daycare or pre-K. No, you're preparing from day one. Yeah. Also, in those same lines, it's preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, and we won't know at birth what your child's potential is. Right. Nobody knows what your child's potential, no, no kid. But um, recognizing that some children may be dramatically and significantly impacted by their autism to right. the point where they won't be living independently, mm -hmm. where they will perhaps always need some level of support. Well, you have to plan for that. Right. You have to be thinking about the in those terms. And now that's pretty overwhelming to tell the parent of a newborn. Right. Um, you know, you need to prepare for your child's future. <laughs> like I'm trying to get through this week. Right. <laughs> well, maybe today, you know. So um, but letting them know as, as if if autism comes into play, if that that label is given or if that seems to be an issue, then you have to start thinking about the future because there'll be numerous times of transition that have to be planned for. Right. You just can't decide, oh, OK, well, tomorrow we're going to start this new thing. Not going really to work. Have to plan ahead. <laughs> All right. All right. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. Um, my next question for you is, how can parents approach the research regarding ASD? This is a great question. And um, I, I'm i glad we're discussing it because I think people hear that a study showed X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. therefore it's going to work. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell parents some deep, dark secrets about research. Right. Okay. All right. Get ready. All right. First thing is just because it's published, don't mean it's good. <laughs> okay. Just because it got published in a journal doesn't mean it's valid, meaningful information. Right. Um, now you think, well, if it got published in a journal, it should be. Not all journals are the same. So the right. first thing I tell parents is, you are looking to read articles that are in a peer reviewed journal. Oh. And um, that may be a phrase that's become more um, known because of all the vaccine issues mm -hmm. we've talked about. You know, they'll say, we have a study, but it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Well, what does right. that mean? That means that, you know, if I'm the researcher, I'm a former researcher, and I would have my little data set, and I would be so excited because I'm like, ooh. I found something. I proved something. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, I also am the person who set out to show this and prove this. So I might be a little biased in my favor. I might not have looked clearly at all of the, the ramifications of my um, study and how I set it up or something like that. So yeah. it's always nice to have other eyes look at it who are not invested in it and right. go, yes, you did find something or they go, oh, mm, no, nope, you forgot about this. I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, okay, back right. to the drawing board. <laughs> so we want our peer input because those are fresh eyes. Those are non-biased eyes. Right. Looking at, at the work. So, um, and not every journal is peer reviewed. Okay. But the journal should, if it is peer reviewed, it says it's peer reviewed. Right. If there's no mention of peer review on the journal website or whatever, click on by. Go away from it. Go away. Run, <laughs> run. Because they're probably not peer reviewing. And so it's basically oftentimes nowadays we have journals that if you pay them, they will publish your work. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> mm, golly gee. So if Maybe. I give you money, you'll do this thing for me, right? Whether it's right or not. Sure. Oh. Because, Ooh. you know, so yeah. 
Um, so just be very cautious and look for for um, that phrase, peer reviewed. Peer reviewed. That's that's the key. So the next thing the parent wants to do once they found a peer reviewed um, article and they they think, wow, maybe this has some meaning for my child. They need to look at the way the research was conducted. What did they they set out to do? So the first thing is, what were they trying to show? And most often with um, with regard to autism, we're talking about treatment. Okay. So some treatment protocol is going to be evaluated for its effectiveness, right. which is good. We should be. So you want to make sure that the children that were being studied in that article bear some resemblance to your child. Right. Okay. Just because the children in this article had success doesn't mean your child will if your child doesn't bear some resemblance to them. Right. Now I'm going to make an absurd example, but let's pretend that the only children that benefited from this um, treatment are blue-eyed blonde children. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a yeah, there's an absurd, but there it is. So my brown hair, brown eyed child, I want to benefit, but right. the data tells me that my child's not like the ones that benefited from this therapy. Right. So I need to be very cautious in approaching that because it may not work for my child. Right. There's probably a reason that it worked for some kids and not others. Mm -hmm. So don't assume that just because you have a child with autism that all autism treatments are going to be effective for your child. And don't assume that every article about autism is going to apply to your child. Right. So that's that's a biggie right there. Um, you want to make sure that um, that the way they set up the, the research mm -hmm. is what we call, um, I think of the word now, um, it has to be, we have to be able to replicate. Okay. We need to be able to do that study again. Right. And find similar results. Right. And um, that happens very rarely. There's not a lot of incentive in academia for um, replication studies. There should right. be, but there's not. Uh, of course. Um, because it's more important to be new and novel than it is to actually affirm what we might or might not know. <laughs> right. But um, so you want to make sure that what they set up is not so convoluted that it can't be done in the real world. Gotcha. You know, it may be the greatest, tre greatest treatment ever, but if it can't physically be done effectively in the real world, then it's not the greatest treatment ever. Right. It's an experimental treatment that in an, an incredibly restricted, controlled environment can work. Right. We don't live in an incredibly restricted, controlled environment. Not at all. So we want to make sure that, um, that not only do the children look like our kids, but that the the, the the therapy that is being evaluated is a, we, that we could actually do it at some point in time in the real world. Right. Uh, you want to make sure that the research was not funded by anyone with a monetary interest in the outcomes. Okay. Which is a fancy way of saying you don't let the fox guard the hen house. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, but. We have to be cautious of that. Certainly, if, if I am ABC company and I gave you a vast sum of money and your result, I, you may feel obligated to make sure your results complement what I thought my company because right. you gave me this money. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, and I'm not, this is not a rare occurrence, oftentimes treatment approaches only are only validated by studies that were funded by the maker of or the the creator of the treatment approach. Oh, yeah. so that's a lot of bias. That's a lot. That's a lot of potential bias. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of potential bias. I'm not saying they are, but right. it's potential bias and we should be controlling for bias at every opportunity. Right. Because we don't want, um, I don't want to turn around and sell someone a treatment. And remember, this isn't like, oh, here's a treatment and it's, we've shown it. Now here, go do it for free. Right. No, they're going to sell you the treatment. Oh yeah. And, and you want to make sure that you're spending your dollars wisely mm -hmm. and that, and that they are not getting results that complement their treatment because they paid somebody to give them results that complement their treatment. <laughs> exactly. So, um, again, I'm, uh, that doesn't mean that researchers are, um, are not ethical and moral and upstanding people. It just means that money can change things. Yes. And we need to be cautious of that. Um, so you just have, yeah, you always want to think if somebody's standing to profit from this, uh, there's some, there's more potential for bias than otherwise. Right. Um, ideally, the subjects are going to be in a randomized, double blind clinical trial. And oh, okay. there's a big, ooh, there's a big phrase, right? Yeah. Um, 
And that technically that's how everybody, every drug is tested. Okay. Um, ideally is that there's a group A and group B and group A gets the actual drug and group B gets the placebo. Right. And if, and, and what we find is that you know, 30% of the placebo group gets better on the not drug, but right. that's another story for another day. <laughs> that's the scary placebo effect. Right. <laughs> um, but we've got these, we don't, we don't want to know who's in the real treatment and who's in the not in the, the, you know, the control group. Right. Because we don't want to then say, I'm seeing improvements because I know you're in the treatment group. Right. Because then again, bias comes into it. Yes. My child's better because I know they're getting the good treatment now. Exactly. So, um, but now, does that always happen? Not always. But that, and that's not because the researchers are bad. It may be limited resources. Um, it may just be the challenge of the treatment. It may be limited time. Um, but you should see a group, you should see two groups, an experimental group, the one getting the treatment, mm -hmm. and a control group, the one not getting the treatment. Right. You're getting a placebo or getting nothing. Okay. And that way you can then make a comparison that says the treatment really does work. Right. Because there's a difference in the experimental group versus the control group. Right. Um, you would want to have a large sample size. And um, that rarely, rarely happens. Yeah. Um, simply because it's not, co it, it costs a lot of money to get a thousand kids in a study. Right. It costs a lot of money to get a hundred kids in the study. Yeah. I know that when I was um, living in some of the more rural parts of the country, when I would try to get um, a, a sample of 15, because 15 or 20, because that means I can use parametric statistics. And uh, yeah, that just made my head hurt to say that out loud. So. <laughs> I despise math and statistics, but anyway, um, that was just a personal aside, <laughs> but you try to get that number because then you can use the more mainstream, the more, the, the, um, the formulas that really look at group differences and right. you can figure out whether you're really changing somebody or not. But in the rural parts of the country, it was hard for me to find 15 kids that were similar enough, right. you know, it, the, the criteria wasn't has autism. You know, that can't be the only criteria. <laughs> exactly. You know, it was has autism. Is this age? Is this, um, has this life experience? Right. You have to control for so many factors. Yeah. So if you're not controlling for all those factors, then you have what we call a heterogeneous group, mm -hmm. meaning they all have the same, that one thing they have in common is they'll have autism. Right. And after that, there's not, not so a you're lot. Finding, your findings are going to be diminished if you don't have that, what we call a homogeneous group. Right. Um, but you should expect if, if I've controlled for all those things, then I should believe that my results have some value or meaning mm -hmm. because I am, uh, I have made the, the, the experimental group as similar as possible. As possible. The control group is as similar as possible. Right. Um, and some studies then they'll do a period of where group A gets the experimental treatment and then group B is control, and then they switch them later, and they'll group B will become the experimental, oh. and group A becomes the control. And obviously, at that point in time, um, some people may know. You don't tell the parents they're in which group they're in. You just switch right. them because again, you're really looking for okay, you didn't get better without the treatment, right? But when I put you in the group, now you're different. So that really strengthens your your, um, your argument that this is a valid and meaningful treatment, right? Um, so. That that's the one of the challenge. There are many challenges. Hearing all this, people can realize, okay, research is hard to do. Yeah, um, it's expensive. It requires time, energy, personnel, and um, and so don't assume, like we said, don't assume that just because it's published that it's going to be good. Right. It may not be. Right. Um, I, as I said before, if you if the treatment that they're studying can't be easily implemented. If you read the description of what they're doing with kids and you're like, that's never going to happen in my life. Right. That's not the treatment approach for you. Yeah. And you have to make that decision as a family. Right. This is not a mom decision or a dad decision or a baby decision. This is a family decision. Yeah. I tell parents all the time, they'll ask me about potty training their child. Mm. And they're like, tell me how to do it. And I'm like, um, there, there's not one way. Right. What do you mean? You know, just make, just tell me what works. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> We have to back off from that and realize that there may be 15 different methodologies. Yeah. You're the parent. You all have to look at these methodologies and go, that one will work for us. This one will not. Right. 
So that's the same kind of thing. You have to make sure that it's going to be um, effective and meet the needs of your family. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's really who we're talking about now. Um, One of the questions that I get a lot after parents have reviewed research is, I read somewhere that there's only one empirically supported treatment for autism and that that's the ABA approach. Okay. And my response is that is not correct. Right. Other approaches have gained, now have empirical support. The problem is, is that the data that supported ABA was still somewhat restrictive. It didn't work for everybody. It required some, in some studies, 40 hours a week of intervention. Oh. That's a full-time job. Yes. That you're not getting paid for. No. That you're probably paying somebody else for. Yes. And what we're, what we're beginning to find now, if you look at the current data that is comparing um, some of those ABA type approaches to um, different approaches that are um, more developmental approaches, what they often call floor time mm-hmm. or the Greenspan approach. Um, and I'm not pitting one against the other. I do what works. Right. My belief is you do what works. Yeah. But this idea that one approach was better than all the rest mm-hmm. is not a valid uh, no. construct. And we no. can't work from that point. So what we have to do recognizing now that when people, when researchers are comparing ABA type approaches to more developmental approaches, we're finding that the outcomes are not necessarily different. Yeah. That both can have positive impact. Right. That the outcome, you can't say, oh, this child definitely did this and this child definitely did this. <laughs> You're just like, oh, they're both doing well. Yay. Right. Yeah. So that goes back to what I said. You pick the approach that works for your family. Right. Need, not because somebody said you should do this. Right. All righty. Wow. Everyone's so, different. So is there a lot to be considered with research? Yeah. Um, and don't, and I encourage parents to go look at um, sites that focus on research. The Autism Research Institute has been around for uh, many, many, many years. <laughs> um they get a lot of pushback because they publish studies, they supported approaches that um, we don't support net, support now. Approaches okay. that are considered dehumanizing. Oh, um, that sort of thing. But that's what they're. That was the state of the the field, right? Thirty, forty years ago. Right. I can't fault somebody for doing that thirty or forty years ago. Right. Um, so don't discount them. They're a clearinghouse for research. Yeah. Don't discount them just because they may have you know had some ideas or made some statements 40 years ago that we don't believe anymore. Right. Um, And so I think there's information out there. Be a critical consumer. Don't just accept it on face value. Read it once, put it down, read it again. Yeah. You know, and that way, and, and then in the meantime, have your spouse or your partner or your grandma or somebody, your mom, somebody else read it too. Right. And come back and go, what did you get from that? Yeah. Because yeah. Hey, just like we said, peer reviews. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you need that in your own life. Somebody yeah. else to look at it and go, is this okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wow. That is so interesting. I didn't know. I don't think I knew a lot about research with ASD. Um, my next question for you is what strategies or techniques might parents um, want to include in their home? Um I mentioned to you earlier before we started recording that I have been organizing my um, grand nephew's Legos. Yes. um, (laughs) Color families. Yes. (laughs) And I highly recommend that for an activity if you want to um, lose your mind very quickly. (laughs) Very quickly. Um, Goodness gracious. But no, organization. It's organization. It's preparation. Kids with autism don't need parents who fly by the seat of their pants. Yeah. Meaning they just go, oh, we're going to do this. That doesn't mean you can't ever fly by the seat of your pants, but it's probably not a great strategy early on. Yeah. Um, you're going to need to be organized. You're going to need to be prepared. And don't be afraid of organization if it's not your thing. Right. Yeah. You know, people are like, I don't know how to. I I posted on Facebook about organizing the Legos and I got people come to my house. I will fly <laughs> you out here. I will pay you to live with us for a week. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you can't afford me. Sorry. You um, can't afford me. <laughs> but ab- absolutely. People, you know, some people think I, if I could be organized, half my problems would go away. Right. So <laughs> I recognize it's not everybody's thing. Find a, a system, an idea, a method, 
read up about it, Google it. There are all kinds of how you clean up your house shows on. Oh, yeah. Um, and just look at those and think what works for you. Um, and what I mean is some people have to have um, a storage system where everything is clear so they can see what mm-hmm. is stored. Because as soon as it goes into an opaque basket, they forget what it is. Right. It's not there anymore or they can't yeah. think about it. Um, or they need everything labeled very specifically. Mm-hmm. So, um, but people can help you create those organizational systems. Um, one of the things you don't do is go out and buy a bunch of stuff. Right. And then come home and shove things in it. Right. Um, uh, that's a mistake people make. They're like, oh, I'll go get an organizer and it will make everything. Yeah, no. No. You have to sort of take all your stuff and make piles. Yeah. Of like items and then figure out, okay, I need big storage for this pile. Yeah. This pile is going to the Goodwill because now that I look at it, I don't even care anymore. (laughs) And this pile just needs a little box and it'll be fine. Yeah. So those kinds of things. Uh, That's how you approach organization. Um, One of the first things I tell parents, um, and this is when the child has probably about a year or two. And the reality is, is if you have a one-year-old, you're not going to know that they're on the spectrum. You may know it intuitively, but you're not going to have the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, You may not have the diagnosis by the time they're two. Wow. which is, um, that's unacceptable in my, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I still see children who are well beyond age three before they're ever given a diagnosis. And I saw them at 18 months and knew that they were on the spectrum. Oh my. Um, we don't do a good job of diagnosing in this country. We have turned the diagnosis process over to developmental psychologists and psychiatrists and developmental pediatricians. And there are only a few of them to go around. Yeah. So, and pediatricians are told that they should screen for autism at every well baby check. And I have parents of three-year-olds whose child tell me their child has never been screened. Oh. For um, and that they've been worried about it. Yeah. That they've been wondering why their child wasn't talking. Yeah. Or why their child didn't appear to look at them. Yeah. Um, so parents are usually questioning well before the diagnosis is made. So again, you're not going to be doing this organizing your house with the one-year-old but you probably ought to be, by the time they're one or two, you're beginning to think this child is experiencing the world differently than I expected. Right. They're developing differently than I expected. Mm-hmm. That may be the time to start thinking about how you organize your home. Right. Um, but certainly once the diagnosis has been, has been made, my recommendation is create yourself a communication central. Yeah. Okay. And that may be that someplace in the house I don't care, a wall space in the house where you can put up um, perhaps a cork board and a whiteboard, some kind of, you know, go to the office supply store and get yourself a nice big wall board with whiteboard area and cork board, whatever you might think you need yeah. and stick it on the wall. And that becomes communication central. What are you going to put there? Well, you're going to put a calendar. Okay. A regular wall calendar. Yeah. Why? Because... Susie goes to preschool three days a week and Susie needs to know which day she's going to preschool. Well, Susie Mm -hmm. can't read a calendar, but we can show Susie by marking off the days. Oh, look, Sunday, we marked it off and there's a red dot on Monday. Red dots mean preschool. Yeah. So we're going to go to sleep and in the morning, you're going to go to preschool. Yay! So let's get your clothes out and get your book bag ready. And we'll even make your lunch tonight and we'll be all ready for preschool tomorrow. Right. And I have parents who are thinking, that is a lot. Yeah. Try to do all that in the morning. Yeah. No. When Susie's three and going, I'm not happy. I don't want to go to preschool. I didn't know it was coming. Yeah. A lot of times kids on the autism spectrum react because they didn't know what was coming. Mm -hmm. You and I can, we may know our schedule. You know, I know my schedule is in my head. And it's right. written down somewhere. For a three-year-old, they're relying on you. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to wake them up and go, hey, we're going to school today. What? What? No. no. Surprise uh, to me. I'm, I'm not planned for this. Right. Um, so get a, you know, putting that calendar. And like I said, color coding it. At the same office store, get yourself some of those little colored sticky discs that yeah. come in usually red, green, yellow, and blue. Mm-hmm. And um, you put, you know, you decide that red is preschool day. Yeah. So every day that there's preschool, you have the red on there. What if there's a holiday? Oh, well, then that's why we use yellow. And yellow is for when we have to change an existing dot. Yeah. 
because that makes more sense than pulling the red dot off. No, preschool still was supposed to happen, but it was a snow day. Uh, so we yeah. put a, we put that or um, preschools closed because of a holiday. Right. Those kinds of things. But okay. Just getting the, the child to recognize, they start to learn, oh, okay, this is how I'm organizing my life. Yeah. This is start starting to make sense. And a lot of children, not all, but a lot of children on the spectrum are, um, I don't want to say visual learners because there's the, the research shows us that kids are not visual versus auditory versus tactile learners. They're a mix of all kinds of things and yeah. it's very task dependent. Mm-hmm. But certainly children with autism, often are more visually oriented. So you can exploit that visual preference, if you will, right. early on. And they're going to become more independent. Yeah. You can say, oh, go look. Go look at your calendar. Wow. Yeah. What, what, de- yeah, what, what color dot is it? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's blue. That means we have soccer practice. Yeah. Because I love seeing little four-year-olds run around on a soccer field. It's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> it is absolutely adorable. So that allows the family to plan ahead. Right. um, So that we're not waking the child up and saying it's time to go to school. Right. Um, We also want to have, what else can we put there? That may be where we keep our social stories. Okay. And social stories are a strategy that parents um, should tap into. There are some pre-published social stories. Okay. Um, A social story is just sort of the script for what's going to come up. Like, um, I'll write one real quick. Um, how to walk in a line. Okay. Okay. Because that's a big, that's a biggie. Yeah. Um, so it may start out, I go to school. When I'm at school, sometimes we walk in a line. That means I stand in front of, you know, one person and behind another person. Sometimes I'm at the front of the line. Sometimes I'm at the back of the line. Sometimes I'm in the middle. Why is that important? Because I've got kids who always need to be the line leader. Yeah. They want to be the line leader. Yeah, not, <laughs> no, no, not today. Thank you. Um, I have kids who always want to be at the end. Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. Right. But the idea that um, that, they, yeah, that there's some variability in that. Right. And so we write this all out. Um, if when I'm in line, that means I stay where my friends are. I don't go faster than they, I don't go slower than they are. Anyway, and it all comes back around to when I'm at school, sometimes I walk in a line. Okay. So that becomes their internal script. Right. You know, um, that's the, often the last line is the most important because that's sort of the thing that you want them to take with them. Right. Uh, I can ask for help if I need it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, there's an important one. <laughs> I can walk in a line. Um, I can tell mommy I don't want to eat that food. Right. That's better than throwing it. Exactly. So let's figure out a way rather than shoving it off the table, let's figure out an alternative. So social stories give us that script that we kind of want the child to internalize so they can deal with different situations. Very, very functional for um, preschool and school age kids. Yeah. Um, And like I said, there's published social stories. There are uh, numerous um, PowerPoint presentations and and Pinterest things about how to write a social story yourself. And I encourage parents to try because there's no magic in it. It'll tell you how to write a social story. Right. And once you've written one, you can you can probably write most. Right. Um, another thing is a visual schedule. So on this communication central is my visual schedule. What is a visual schedule? Well, thank you so much for listening. This concludes the first part of our two part episode with Dr. Lynn Adams about parenting on the spectrum. So make sure to follow us on your favorite podcasting platform so that you see our next episode release and you don't miss anything. Thank you again so much for listening and we'll see you next week.